We are live now. We've caught up. We're watching this game as it's happening. Ash Blue One. Guma original. This is his original power pick on Varus, and they love this into the Ash. They say they're gonna be they're gonna be really strong with this. Canyon picks up his Nidalee, he's gonna put on his world's skin, I guarantee it. Chovy has got Tristana. Uh, this is a preemptive counter to Oriana. Someone that would normally be very good with the Varus and the Skarner for the extra shields and for the big ultimate. I absolutely love a Jax pick right here. I hope that they stick with it. You can blind pick here and then take away Poppy Gragas and the bands, which is uh, something that I expect to happen. We'll see whether or not they go with it. Cassante? I mean, all right, Keen Sante. This is more of a targeted pick more than anything else. He has shown that he's willing to take this pick into Jax. So this is more of a response to the player that's up in the top lane. Uh, Keen has proven to be one of, if not the best, Cassante players around. But that means that you do have Poppy and Gragas available. They might say, hey, we're okay with Keen playing those because you've got Nidalee. You're not going to have enough power on that side of the map that we can actually just still push in. Poppy will probably a little bit scarier than Gragas. I expect, I mean, they might have a read on the champion pool and say they're, they're just not going to go there, but Gragas would already round out this team nicely. So would Poppy, right? Poppy's going to stop some of the dive potential. Plus, it's going to be totally solid into Jax. And it's another body that can dive in to create some space for the Poppy, or for the Tristana and the Ash. I, I told you that Faker would drop the gauntlet. Did I not? And that he's daring Chovy to pick it up and say, you want to come out play me? Like, come at me. Let's see. You want to jump into me and see if I land my charm? See if I've still got it? We'll see. We'll see. What kind of answers would we have? We're totally expecting Poppy. What's the other? What, we're going to have counter pick on support, except we're not because it's red team. And anytime T1 gets red, they go for counter pick support. So what are we going to get? It could be... I mean, they're basically going to try to outscale slightly. Outrange slightly. That's what they want to do. So they're going to wait to pull out the answer here and say, whatever you do, we'll come up with the answer. Because of Nidalee, I think that Bard is possible in this game. You can say, all right, Nidalee can be flying around the map, but so can I, and I can be wherever you're going to be. We've also seen Karia's Pike. Maokai, Maokai Poppy, technically a double flex. They can go back and forth. And they could send this to either lane. And in fact, Poppy Ash is the one that I would play against. If you're T1, Poppy Ash is devastatingly powerful. So when you go into this draft, I think you need to go assuming that it's going to be Poppy Ash and that you're going to defend against that lane and make sure that you're okay elsewhere. It's always a pike angle. All right, let's talk about pike things. Pike is going to roam early and often. You're going to try to get as much resources into the Varus so that he can get those extra ranks into the queue so that he can solo farm. They can be hyper aggressive in the early game. I expect them to hold this for a long time. Now, because of the Pike, they might choose that we want to go one way or the other. I expect them to swap this back. They get until 20 seconds to do that. It looks like they're actually not trying to do it. They're trying to put Keen on, on Poppy and they're going to fight back against Jax is what it looks like. This is a, I don't know, I don't see the exact timer, but I think it's locked in right now. Oh, oh no, all right, Maokai and Bot. So they've got Maokai and Bot, Poppy and Top. It's, it's awesome that you can go into a blue draft and have some amount of flexibility and force the enemy teams to come up with a creative answer. Poppy pre-blocks Pike as an option. But we knew that Pike was still going to be there because it's such high tempo that you can move around the map and you force the enemy team to make tough decisions. Karia is probably playing as good, or at least this entire bot lane is playing as good as any other player in this entire tournament. And so if you're going to say, hey, Karia, you're playing the best, then yeah, we want to put the game in your hands. We want to give you access to the best champs in the game or best your champs to make the most impact on plays in the game. I'm hyped. Game four. One final nod to the coaches. Do not assume that this game ends here. You have to assume that Gen.G wins. So previously we talked about having this nebulous idea of what adjustments you'd like to make. You know this is the only result that you need to prepare for. 
you do not need to prepare for this because this one's done if it's if it happens it's done you don't need to work both coaching staffs need to assume that this is going to happen and if it does what are the elements so we're going to be looking at this game through the lens of gen g winning what will it lo look like if gen g wins this game All right, Ward, 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 three defensive wards early. Genji saying we don't want any surprises. <clears throat> we blew all of our mental stack on the draft and whether or not we were flexing and we don't have anything else for you. Um, or conversely, one, two, three entrances are covered. The last one is right here. So they just go for the invade on four, on, on pocket number four. Oh, sweeper. Oh my good. They saw him and they don't know that it's seen. All right, pays no flash and down by 30% means he is super far behind in this position here. Zombie wards coming up from Lahens. I love this from the Maokai. Going to try to control space. If we're going to win this game, Canyon's going to get in their face. We're going to play super high tempo with these two champions, these three champions. Poppy's going to try to hold space, make sure that Jax can never join into a fight. You're sort of uh, trying to stonewall. You're trying to stone the Jax to get in. Poppy's totally fine in this matchup, can hold her own in every which way. Zayu's fighting for level one, gets it for himself. He's moving over. Skarner doing a two camp and coming over. They hit level two here, flash down from Maokai. This is, all right, so if you're Skarner, regardless of what your plan was, you change it. You have to adjust. And you say, Zayus, all right, your weak side. Even though, even though your Jax into Poppy, and it is a swingable matchup that you can say you can get far, you can get ahead in this matchup and win. It takes so much work to get Jax to the point where they're actually definitively ahead of Poppy. Whereas on the other side, they already are, right? And Varus, this is what they like. They like to outrange. They like to play for this maximum effectiveness. Dean is holding, using all of his resources to keep that wave there. A very, very precarious position to be in. Especially, this is very nice from him, knowing that Skarner is going to want to come back to this side of the map. Alright, this is the biggest and easiest gank, the easiest wall to gank with in the game for Skarners. Three flashes down. They're saying, no, we're not even, we're not even going to mess around with this. And look for a little bit of extra HP. Guma actually stepping in. You see, he tried to do that little swivel trick that we talked about. Very, very high level of execution. Where you can get an extra hit in. And these players know how to do it. But the difference between getting a turret shot, obviously gigantic. What you'd like to see here is a push. I would have preferred to see Skarner help the Ari to push so that four people could go and dive this. But you see that Canyon, uh, Canyon's already in position. They spot out the Nidalee, so Pike just dives back out and says, okay, that's fine. We invested jungler time. That's totally fine. Each one of each element of our lead can be expressed in a, in a unique way, right? It doesn't need to be kills. It doesn't need to be plates. Sometimes you can say, I forced the Nidalee to stay down bottom even after she took Krugs. And this is also going to mean that Zeus can play much more aggressively up in the top side. Remember how keen... Spent 30% of his HP to keep that wave there. That hurts. And that changes the matchup. Every decision that these guys make makes a decision in the macro sense. And they can communicate with each other. So if we're Gen G and we're thinking about how we can win it, game five. The ways that we're going to come back and win this game. We have to make sure that we're more proactive in the beginning. because And make sure that we are covering all the bases when we go because they are ready to answer we can't go into a game where five where we're spending five minutes just worrying about flash cooldowns area tried to uh overthink that one but you know what it don't even call it an overthink because now he'll see okay keen is willing to step back next time it'll be a mental game and they'll start leveling each other is he willing to actually continue running straight back again or is that the time he's going to juke they're going to download that information and gather it over the course of the game. If you're Gen G and you escape this game, you're making sure that going into game five, you don't give up as many freebies here. You need to make sure that there's more purpose. Hold on. Uma is really far up. They did plan on a rebound, and you're supposed to be able to hold this wave, but Maokai does step all the way up, goes around, and gets the lens on Varus. It is going to cost him a biscuit and a potion. But he's still going to be able to pick all of this up, and Ash can't go any further. 
right because we're talking we're talking about less money spent and it's not as consolidated as a serrated dirk uh, interesting they're not actually going to opt for a freeze they're saying enemy team's going to back they could try to freeze this but they end up just trying to pop it are they going to go along with a rotation look at this team they're already rotating over serrated dirk is in pocket so this is a play for the void for the void grubs ari's playing aggressively as well skarner's playing aggressively everyone's in position chain cc is going to be enough to get the kill and they already have varus pike in position this is a huge huge advantage for t1 it means skarner's going to get to start this play pike's going to come join him guma can even come join join in on the xp because they got the push in there is nowhere to be taxed genji can only try to react and go to the spot chain cc again Beautiful, guys. All right, Poppy's able to get one. Guma flashes over the wall. Let's see if they reconsolidate over here. Line of scrimmage. They do. They say, you know what? It's not that big a prize. It's not worth risking any kind of fight. These guys are coming out of base. They might have a little bit extra. Tristana still has not gotten that extra base. She's getting really greedy on this. This is something we have seen from Trovi, that he'll try to greed a little bit for extra backs. And the way to punish that is to make proactive macro plays in his face while he hasn't shopped because he's trying to get the perfect base off because he wants to be so almost sounds insulting to say this but solo queue you know, like pub star advantage where i'm better than you because i'm five cs ahead of you because i got a better back off that might win you an extra two percent of your solo queue games but in pro that will cost your team tempo you are on the map at seven minutes or six minutes into the game with just a longsword you are not really a contributor to that fight Right, that Varus came in. Varus is a lower level, but he's stronger than you are because of that serrated Dirk. So congrats, you've got your 5 CS lead. This is what we talk about, but uh, look who's winning. All right, proactive play. Are they going to try to go for this? You're already going to have Karia in position. Varus going to go for max wave, max range clear. Oh, look at this from the pike. Times the Q as the Maokai's come. Are you kidding me? Somebody wants a pike skin. All right, 2K gold lead. We're in snowball territory. Canyon has not been able to do anything because his team has been flashless. If they win this game, I mean, it's it's starting to seem increasingly unlikely, but if they win this game, they need to make sure that this pick coincides with aggressive plays for the team and that if you're burning flash, you're doing it for aggressive reasons, right? You need to be able to empower the Nidalee. Right now, Skarner is getting run of the map Versus Nidalee. Versus Canyon's Nidalee. Sure, he's down three camps, but he doesn't really care right now because he's got a kill and an assist to his name. He's going to be springboarded. Springboarded into the mid game, and he's going to have that early hard steal. Look at this. Pike actually leaving it because Ari says, you know what? Tristana can't approach the wave right now. Don't even execute this. Right? Something that... that will get laners infuriated in, in your pub games with your supports when they come in and like, I've got charges to use, let me use them. And the laner's like, bro, <laughs> I'm freezing the wave. Like, let it chill here. I've got a huge advantage. Let's just take that as our win. I don't care about your blood song. I care about my ability to steamroll this guy and just keep him, keep him down. All right, 86 CS. Tristana feels the need to pick up. Wow. Boots and refillable at a nine minute buy. Going back to base with 500 gold, having nothing to do, even though he was at 70%. Remember when he said that he was going to greed a little bit to stay a little bit too long on that first one? You're seeing the dominoes fall from that position. The fact that he tried to take so much from that spot means that now he's like, shoot, I need to struggle to catch up. I need to catch up. They're playing through mid. I need to get my boots. These are the things that should have been bought the first time around. Make sure even though you have that buffer, Every single one of these champions has the ability to lock you down. So you need to make sure that you're able to get into position. Normally we see a rush Berserker Greaves. This time it looks like we saw elements for the Blade of the Rune King. And Blade of the Rune King is always an answer to this right here. The Heart Steal from Skarner. So you're saying, hey, this is my answer. I want to deal maximum amounts of damage to this Skarner in a front to back. But that means that you're going to have to get into range of these two spells, which are high impact spells cc that pulls you back into the team all right 
does have the TP available. All right, T1 has leads everywhere. They should be able to fight for everything. They don't even fight for beach wards here, but you see Pike going into the most likely junction that's going to bring any amount of threat, and he's just hovering here. He doesn't need to do anything else. We'll see whether or not he goes for an Umbro Glaive first. We have seen the oh, Gyro Sword, the Cyclo Sword, Cyclo Sword. That is the highest impact. All right, there we go. So that's the third time now that Pike has aimed for that up high. Next time he's going to go under the poppy. He's going to get that hook. The question is whether or not he wants to. But the highest impact first first item for Pike is the Cyclosaur. Because you show up, you dash, you get the stun. Then you get the big slow to go along with it. It makes you much more lethal. It's the higher damage. And from this point, they might they might be saying that we're willing to go that avenue. Probably going to be a Yomu's and opportunity for Varus. They're going to try to continue squeezing this game. We've got... A pretty heavy index on physical damage makes Poppy's life easier. You will get to a scaling point where this team will be tough to front to back. We can have Poppy step up in front, and then you're going to have these guys go. Try to rip through the fight, the fight front to back. But this is a very similar draft to what we had from T1 in Game 2, that they've fallen behind with these double ADs. And now what's, what's the recourse? What, where do we go from here? Do we ever, like, find an opportunity to get these guys onto the map ever again? Because it, it might not happen. Alright, hold on. Dave's getting kind of greedy for this? He didn't have help. Now, what's Canyon doing? They're pulling off and saying we need to go somewhere else. This was one of your best chances possible. 100%. They had to, they have to shoot that shot. And all right, so if you're Gen G right now, your chances of winning this game are very low, right? We're talking that this game is already about 2080. If your chances of winning the game are 20% and you can make a play that is either good if no one shows up or really bad if someone shows up, you still take that because the chances of them being there might still be something like 40, 60. Hey, it might over time just not be a very good play but you take this over this whenever you can. So look for these shots. You need to be able to take these shots. If I'm coaching T1 in game five, I'm gonna say, hey, we did great. Let's get out to that same good lead. If we get that lead, remember that they have to take punches. They have to swing their way out. It's like a boxer being down going into the 15th round. All they can do is, is knockouts. Right, let's say you've won enough rounds going forward, which is kind of like what's happened. The scorecard is in your favor, you win. It's like a chess match too. You've got an early advantage, you got a piece when they weren't expecting you to get it. And you've got this advantage, you're just whittling it out. The best answer is the immediate and thorough volley of punches that can come out. And they basically need to blitz you. They need to say, we need full front attack. We need to find our punches and go for them as much as possible because any time that you can take this 40-60, this is much better than what you're getting offered for the rest of this game. All right, same thing that we've seen from Skarner's all tournament long. I'm going to step up. A little bit different that there's no one to give him any amount of buffer here. We've seen we've seen Lulu and Oriana as ways to, to keep him topped off in these sort of situations, but right now he's being left to his own devices. He only has the heart steel with no stacks. So he's not actually that tanky yet, but all he's really doing is stalling and biding his time. All right, Kiria's looking to get in position. You turn the shark on, you let the pressure proc. They get that upfront damage. Chovy is going to try to take the punch on the Kiria, and I like that he flashes away. He's lit up, so he's not actually going to start healing until right now. I like that they were biding their time there. In games where there's high pressure scenarios, you cannot underestimate what an ability like this does. Just like Nocturne turning out the lights, although at this point people have enough experience with Nocturne that they tend to have pretty good answers to him. When you cast this, it goes right that like Jaws sound or like the deathly in the background. That elevates your blood pressure. You can't not feel it. It becomes a high intensity moment. And the longer you can keep your opponent who is nervous in that position, 
the better. The mind games are insane. We saw Chovy in the pregame talking to uh, talking about his first experience versus Faker, where he was impressed by wow, his fundamentals are on point. He doesn't make a mistake, and he plays tons of mental games. And Chovy needed to script his game to a point where he could just win through that no matter what in the 1v1. But what we saw, you know, over their history, what is it, 52-50 now in favor of Faker? The big games have more often gone to T1, and I'm talking about the championships, not even the regional championships, these ones. The Worlds. Chovy still goes for a little bit too much of personal glory in these games, and we saw it again this game. He overstayed in lanes. If we get to game five, Gen G, coach, I want you to play a high tempo, Chovy. I don't mind if you're down five CS this game. I want you to make sure that you're always the strongest you can be on the map. It's not about you getting a tiny advantage over your laner because they're getting too much done. I want you to make sure that you take that first recall window that you see and you take it, you get back on the map and you stay strong. And especially as we're approaching objective timers, this is going to be crucial. Oh, we may not get there. What else? What other factors are we looking at? Ward line right here, super defensive, right? They're looking to only control a minimal amount of space. This is all that Gen G has right now. And this is the snowball advantage of T1. They can continue taking more and more of this. Look how aggressively Guma is posturing right now. That is wild that he was that far up and feeling comfortable about it. This defensive line, I don't know if they know about this defensive line. Someone's spam pinging. Okay. Um, knowing that they have this much, this many points of strength and playing for that point of strength and perhaps even saying, you know what, I'm just faster than you. You cannot collapse on me. You don't have the tools. I have the speed to dodge the Ash Arrow. I have the speed to dodge the Nidalee Spear. And, and I can run straight away from Maokai Ultimate. So there's literally nothing you can do unless you can get behind me. And because all of their wards are invested on this part of the map, there is no angle to get to that. If you're Gen G, you're going to have to find a pocket, tuck a ward somewhere back here. They're talking about the four seed out of Korea as if T1 were like a real four seed. It is disingenuous to not acknowledge this that happened all season long. They were getting attacked, right? We talked about it in pregame. This team was forged in the crucible of the harshest season that you could imagine. You are the world champs. Everyone is gunning for you. Everyone's been gunning for Faker for the better part of a decade. You have Showmaker, Scout, BDD, Knight, Chovy, all of these guys... Zeka, who have Faker on the pedestal saying, I want to come after you. And they've been holding him back. So the target's been on their head the whole time. And on top of that, they're getting criticized for being weak. And it's not their fault. They're being attacked. They can't practice. They couldn't get scrims in. They couldn't do anything. And the players couldn't even play solo queue games at one point because their facility was getting completely hacked. All right, they counter. Lahens goes for the charge. This is a bait. Genji is trying to bait this play. They're saying we need to get the most amount of damage here. This is one of the best chances we get is if they don't get a prepared defense ready for us. They do get a significant chunk of damage out, but it's not enough. I'm super happy with Genji though for taking that punch. Normally you don't ride that in because it's such a high risk play. But like we said, you want to take those risky plays that have a potential for a high payout. If the enemy team was not prepared to defend against a riding champion, then yeah, like that that's a window. You can say, hey, they might over overreact going for the rest of this. Skarner tries to pull them back in, but the strength of Skarner is enough. Double AD carry composition means we're gonna have Randuin's omen. Hold on. Faker teleported. Did he just pull a Chovy? He just pulled a Chovy. Teleporting to a ward as they're being strong. So they do go with the kill. They do get a stun back on Canyon, who's under the turret now, so he's dead. Deus is gonna start moving over, which means that they're gonna get Lahens as well. Was it all a bait? Calculated.
I don't think that this was a bait call. This was a, hey, everyone come here strong. And because they spent so much on me, they are going to be open to a retaliation. This is a good answer from Gen G, by the way. I don't like what Ash is doing. They shouldn't be leaving unless it's unless it's leaving to go take this. The dragon's inconsequential, guys. You do not go for the dragon here. Dragon is a lesser prize. This is a season 14 thing, but le dragon is a lesser prize than the outer tier two turret. The sheer amount of gold on this turret is way too much, especially when we're talking about bounties going into these games. Even if you were to go get that dragon, it's just a dragon, guys. It's not that much. People talk about it being worth like a thousand golden stats and they, they worry about the type of dragon it is. Remember, it's about your carries multiplying their levels, their gold. You're just adding a little bit of power to one carry. Yeah, your team's getting a little bit of extra of extra effects but that's not enough compared to getting for example an ash 1100 gold pushing that wave getting that turret and being able to recall and saying i am that much stronger me personally so if there's a fight where you dive into me i can win it that's what you need in these positions it's not going to be about one single dragon dragon all right bearing down i don't think there's going to be very much counterplay they actually have pike in the middle because he's so mobile He's got the Swifties, and he did go for Umbro Glaive, so he's controlling all the vision. Jax is playing weak side. They're happy to take this tier two. Now they're going to rotate over, and they might swing the Jax over onto this weak side. Expect them to come over, go for mid prile, and control the Western Quadrant here. This is great. This is great by Gen G. You take your punch, you commit everything, you try to get this kill. Absolutely fantastic. You go for that. The answer is just simply that we still have people in position and Pike is so quick. Skarner's already moving. Zeus also commits his teleport. This is where the shot calls come in where you say, I need help. I need help, right? Hopefully just once. I need help. And that should give everyone the cue that they need to start moving right away. And you say, everyone full thing. I need help. Five man defend. And you bring everyone to that spot. You punish the other team for using eight cooldowns trying to go for that kill on you. And you take the maximum in return. All right, wave in middle is pushed up. They've got full control of this quadrant. They've swept out most of the of the wards, but they've left up a couple here. That he's a little bit too close to be a real threat. Poppy getting a double knockup is a potential avenue for a change, but they're still going to take this fight. Even if Zeus dies here, which he will, uh, they're going to take the rest of this fight because of how strong everyone is. But hold on, Pipe Pike got popped at the at the cost of Poppy. It's a it's a worth trade if you're T1. You generally don't want to be trading at all, but obviously a top lane resource is going to be much bigger, especially one that has two items. So you're okay with that but that poppy play by keen was absolutely fantastic to blow the fight up and that's that's exactly what you don't want if you're t1 if you're gen g it's throw your punch i get any amount of progress for the rest of this game i mean any one missed ultimate one blown flash one person out of position if i'm gen g i'm taking that shot that was kind of interesting he's he's winding up pike goes to grab him but because you get locked up in the animation it means that he's guaranteed to get hit by that pike tried to go for the execute but it looks like he wasn't able to get enough because of a hit from maokai like that would be wild i want to see that in slow motion they're still alive but uh but t1 now with a tremendous lead we've got a finished rabbit on his death gap from the from ari which is a huge deal and i bet we're going to see fights right here off of the seeker's arm guard Three completed items, and I mean, this one not yet, but once it's there, three completed items from from both of your carries, and you're about to get Seeker's Arm Guard here, and you've got your core from the Skarner. Pike has all the world, all the items that he'll ever need. Form of that Umbral, he will go for one more Lethality item later just to get a little bit extra scaling, but you see this, look at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten wards being used in this pocket to say that we can control this area for the rest of the game and specifically we want to axe these two turrets down if you're gen g you full defend you need to take whatever fight comes to you your things are only going to get worse you're down a full item from your mid laner but that's it that's essentially the extent of the of the leads anywhere everyone else is consolidated they're okay right this this is fine especially compared to lethality you're going to be scaling in that position you'll be okay there you're not going to get much better, especially if you start bleeding out more resources like tier two turrets. Now, 
I want to see Maokai not play front to back. It looks like he's trying to play front to back so he can just cast an ultimate and have his team, his AD carries, rip into the enemies in a front to back fashion. But if you actually want to find this fight, you're going to have to try to get this Maokai ultimate. Hope that you get them to stack up and then poppy ult some amount of them out in that situation. That's the fight I'm looking for if I'm Gen G. Uh, people stacking up for the root also means that Nidalee will necessarily get to hit her spear. She's set up with the Zonias, which means that she's looking to dive into the fight by as much time as possible. Uh, but this is a very low damage build. So they may say that, hey, we're willing to just like fight you. <laughs> we're willing to, to fight you in this spot. You can come in. We'll just keep on taking this damage up. Seeker's Arm Guard is picked up. They're going to check off all the boxes here. 10 seconds left on this dragon. There's no threat of the Baron. They can take this if they take it right away. Still be over in time. They take the spot. Skarner's unflappable. Doesn't need to care about a uh, Nidalee damage at all. There's a little bit of threat around this wall where you can like look to jump in or deal max damage here. They're going to pull it out. This is what you always do. Line of scrimmage right here. Control ward in this position. They control this bush. So Pike's controlling the vision here. Varus ultimate's down. That's probably enough for Genji to say, let's go. But uh, Jax is in position now, so they're going to take this fight. Kiryu's actually jumping to the other side of the fight because he's Pike. And uh, they do get the dragon, so that basically wipes out most of the comeback potential there. Uh, but it's going to come down to Tristana if Tristana can carry this fight. Pike gets interrupted. They don't get enough. Look at this front-to-back fighting. Jax is actually not getting enough done. Ari's trying to do more, but it's actually not enough. Genji takes the fight. That's Dragon and Baron, guys. We got a problem with scaling now too. This was what we wanted, but you let them in by missing too many spells, right? Playing a little bit too far forward for too long. You could have just played back and said, we can dare, we can dare and make this swap. We can threaten Baron. This dragon's inconsequential. Losing this dragon fight means you always lose the Baron, which is why you just never need to go for it. You should just set up for Baron. They can't take that fight in front of Baron because you, you don't feel any pressure going for the, for the dragon. Let's look at the fight. Ari up front, the thing spawned right in the middle of that fight. Karyo is actually a non-factor, hasn't done anything yet in the fight. Tries to get his ultimate off, but again, it's not in execute, so they don't get that front off. Baker dashing to the side, but look how Satan... All right, so there's a little syncopation, you see that? He's giving the call to his team. Karyo comes over this way. As Jax is coming in, as Guma's moving back and as Faker's moving back. So this little syn syncopation just does not work. You can't you can't be playing back with your carries where they're feeling threatened as some of your members are going forward. You want to be moving together. And this team very much wants to be standing behind the Skarner, getting a flank, flank from the Jacks, and that's it. And Pike can be off to the side, you know, sort of harassing, but he will get outscaled for the rest of this game. Horizon focus on spears there. So they've got Baron, but they were still down on... Well, now they're even on gold. So this gets them back into the game. It's not going to springboard them ahead, but they are back in the game. thought this was the uh, win probability. Wouldn't that be wild if it were here? Gold difference over time. Yeah, they springboard it back to themselves. They are they are alive. Maokai ultimate. That's going to set them up. Skarner responds with his ultimate of his own. They reposition. You see this fight. Everyone's hiding behind owner. They're fighting everything to get this wave back. Jax is going to fight against the poppy in mid lane. I like this position. Look how Pike's stepping off to the side over and over. Right, constantly trying to harass. I like what Faker's doing, dashing forward. Buying yourself 30 seconds can be a huge window, but it looks like they're actually going to step back and try to defend this turret. They need to try to get this turret back to 30% health, which means that they're giving up the top side. That's another 1,000 gold into the pockets of Gen G. They're going to springboard back ahead. Also, Bot Wave might be pushing up. How strong was this? That's a significant chunk as well. All right. So now it does come down to a Dragon Soul. It is Hextech Soul. It will not be the be-all and end-all, but it is a huge advantage for T1 if they can get it cleanly. 
Genji, they're going to try to make it as messy as possible. Nidalee Spears, you've got Ash Poke, Nidalee Poke. It's not as much damage as Varus, but now that you have three items on Nidalee, if any of these do connect, it's going to be a significant chunk of damage. Plus, you're putting the traps out to try to get that Landry's uh, passive stacking up before you throw. If you can get any of those jumps off in that position, you're going to be very happy, especially with the Zonia's. Three items picked up. We see Elixir being picked up. Vamp Scepters from the carries. Everything is being invested into this next fight. This preparation, one minute left. I'd like to see Jax pushing further on the other side of the map if I'm T1. It looks like ever ever since the defense right here where Poppy knocked two of them out, they haven't felt confident about any any move. Pike will get outscaled. Varus will get outscaled. These are problems that they're going to have to deal with. Now, something that we haven't seen that I'm curious about. What about Blade of the Rune King on Varus after you go Lethality? This used to be a play, and I know that it's not the same Blade of the Rune King that it used to be back then. It had the active, so it had like a peel item. It had uh, self-peel attached to it. But if you can deal you know something that deals maximum health damage is actually very good dealing physical damage with lethality but did they, i don't know they changed something there must be something about it that i'm missing you can let me know in the comments if, if you know what it is all right they go alt on to skarner that's not the target you want it's got to be over here Varus goes but they pick off they pick off ari that's going to be gg no the rest of the team is the rest of the team going to carry poppy ultimate over the back king's stuck in front by himself this is poppy with his w up he's super tanky but skarner's going to be strong enough to take him down they end up going two three for one they end up avenging and look at this carry up all game all game long has been throwing his hooks over the head north of the champions and finally Right, all game long he's been aiming here, finally aims right down here, knowing that he's trained them for that moment. This is the crucial moment, the mind games, guys. So tight, are they going for the end right here? They can do it, Canyon's the only one up. They, he goes to try to in for the wave, he's using Zonia's. That one minion's gonna die, which means that they have to wait for the next wave. Next wave is up in time, you've got Maokai, you've got 15 seconds on Nash, they can go for this. Maokai's gonna try to in for the wave, he's trying to pull a Busio, try to pull the wave as far back as possible. And now you have Ash coming up in five seconds. This should be game. This should be GG. They go forward. Ash is going to wake up just in time to watch the Nexus die. And they got it. They avenge Ari. They get the kill. What a banger series. As we watch, as we watch T1 celebrate, they they were poised for this. Like I said, team team forged in the crucible of of the hardest year that we've ever seen a team have to go through but now we get exactly what we wanted we called this match last november as t1 beat weibo and you saw blg saying like oh my god what have we done they had literally in their mind skipped ahead of weibo gaming and said we're, we're already thinking of t1 they lost in that best of five the only games the only series they've lost to Weibo since then in playoff matches, nine and zero. That is how vindictive BLG was against that team. Not only that, but they're augmented by their new mid laner with Knight, who is the Chovy of China, the best player in undisputed at this point, because now he's got more accolades than Zhao Hu and Uzi and is playing at the world championship stage. That team has had T1 marked since the first game of this season we saw on emoting as they beat top esports who was supposed to be their top contender with a t1 crest my eyes are on you my eyes are on worlds i'm coming for you at the world championship that's what matters our best of one that we played three weeks ago does not mean a thing yeah. because we're waiting for you in the finals i will see you there i will see you guys there i expect to see you there i appreciate all the love and support we've been getting a lot of like subscribers so i appreciate everybody for all of that make sure you're staying tuned we'll be here on saturday i believe it's going to be a later start because we have the syncopations of daylight savings time from europe and us so it's a 10 a.m start next week but we are here for it what are the other matchups that we're looking at i mean obviously zeus versus bin Bin has basically offered the challenge. Multiple times in interviews, he said, you know, to the answer, who would you like to play against? Oh, I want to play against T1. I want to play against Zeus. 
Look at Carrier. Look at those emotions. That guy know he played out of his mind. And that's what it can feel like when you play your absolute best. We've spoken about it on this channel about revving the engine and how you have to go up to 4K, 5K. Sometimes you have to save up that energy to go 7K to just go at full speed, but then you need to be able to bring yourself back down. That, what you're seeing on Carrier's face right now is someone recoiling from the amount of energy that took. You better believe that these guys burned thousands of calories on stage today because the mental pressure, it's not from the muscles, although those are attributing as well. The mental pressure, the mental strain, Carrier was locked in. And if you're the coaches and you say, this guy will take me home when I need him to, he will play an incredible game when I need him to, we'll give him counterpick on red side because that's the guy who's going to take us home. He is playing at such an exceptional level. Shout out to On, who's been willing to play with range advantage, game theory, optimized, you know, taking risks even at moments where it is actually risky so that the time that you do want to step forward, you can be a little bit more brazen and maybe the enemy team says, oh, I'm going to call your bluff this time. Yep, JK, this is the time. Let's go. Knight versus Faker is going to be insane. I expect Knight to be the much better player mechanically. Uh, Jun is probably going to get the start. I don't expect to see Wei because Jun's just been on a higher level. Owner has shown that he can be that proactive player for the team. Jun has been a Skarner master, so this will very much come down to Skarner Pryo, Ash Pryo, support counter picks, and we're going to have brawls in the mid lane. Brawls in the top lane. Guys, this is going to be so sick. I can't wait for it. I'll see you guys there. Thanks so much for supporting the channel. As always, keep it surreal. Peace. Thank <laughs> you.